thanks everyone for coming. The August edition of uh, System Thinking Ontario. I think people are off in cottages, and so I'm hoping to have more time for discussion um, on this session. Um, and um, we'll go around and have our introductions to everyone. Um, this is actually, uh, it was intended a little bit more as a discussion, but as I was starting to work on this, I ended up getting um, sidetracked a little bit. Um, and I'll explain a little bit why. But uh, what, what we'll do is we'll focus a lot on normal accidents and then on both ends of it, the beginning and the end, we'll kind of bookend that. So um, why don't we go around and do our usual introductions. And the question for today is, um, I guess one, have you heard of the book Normal Accidents? Or two, if you haven't heard of the board of the book Normal Accidents, did you watch the movie uh, China Syndrome? Um, so, we'll just go around. Um, let's see, Zad. Are we introducing ourselves as well? Yeah. Okay. My name is Zad Khan. Uh, I'm a graduate from the SFI program. So I came to Systems Thinking Ontario through Strategic Foresight Innovation at OCAD University, where Peter Jones is one of the assistant professors in the program. And that's how I met David Ng and was introduced to Systems Thinking Ontario. Um, I only recently heard of normal accidents through David. So this is a bit of a spoiler. Um, so I'm familiar of it because we've been surfacing that as part of our systems changes research project. And he brought that to attention. So I haven't seen, I haven't seen the film. If that was the question. And I'm only familiar with an introductory level of the concept of normal accidents. Thanks, Ad. Jessica? Because Jessica's in Scotland and she's on mute at the moment. So I don't know if she can come out of mute. Uh, we'll let her go and come back to her later if she has an opportunity. Griff. Hey, everybody. I'm Griff. Nice to see you all tonight. Uh, I have been coming to Systems for a couple of years now. I guess it's about that long. Uh, really enjoying myself. Do a little bit of work with Peter uh, on some related projects. Uh, and no, I haven't seen, I'm not familiar with this book. And uh, I wanted to watch that movie. I, I, to my knowledge, it's the first time you've ever linked like pop culture into something in Systems that I recall. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, I would love to uh, check it out, but yeah, I haven't had the time just yet. Okay. Thanks, Griff. Kelly. Hey, I'm Kelly Okamura. I'm calling in from Toronto. Uh, I came through systems through Peter Jones and Design with Dialogue. And I'm still here. <laughs> oh, oh, as far as Normal Accidents, the book. Uh, haven't read it, and I've not seen China Syndrome. Wow, Academy Award-winning winning film, I guess it's too old for people. So, but I'll ask Richard if maybe he's old enough to have seen the film. <laughs> <laughs> I've not read the book nor seen the film. I'm old enough to have heard about it, but I've not run, seen the film. But I've been at industrial safety for 40 or 50 years, some long time. And I've been working in systems and chaos and complexity for 35 years, so... I'm really interested in what you might say. I do a lot of work with industrial safety. In the US, we're killing 5,300 people a year at work, and that number is not going down in the last seven or eight years. So something's not right here. I think it's because they're not using systems thinking. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Richard. <clears throat> so Peter, someone who watches films? <laughs> well, actually, I only saw that on television. Yeah, I don't go to the, uh, so the China syndrome goes back a few years. Um, I'm familiar with the, the concept of, um, uh, of normal accidents, but more, uh, but only really had come across it, hadn't read about it. I'm more of a, a fan of uh, David Woods' work in, in resilience engineering and his, and his uh, human factors uh, approaches to analyzing the, the root causes and the human factors in in major accidents he was part of the the uh, the investigation into the challenger 
accident and one of the ones that really uncovered what actually happened and why with, uh, you know, from the analysis of the PowerPoint and everything, he was on the, on the commission. David Woods is, you know, a, a leading uh, human factors and systems engineer at Ohio State University. And so I'd, I'd recommend his, his contributions to this as well and to high reliability organizations. I mean, so we're some ways look at, when we're looking at what, you know, the, the sources of these types of, um, you know, the interactions at, at the root causes of that lead to chain, you know, chain reactions for significant accidents that uh, the idea that David, that David Woods was, was, um, it was one of the originators of the original meaning of resilience engineering was building in system buffers and, and, and checks and balances that you, you'll see in healthcare and nuclear power plants and other high reliability situations. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off the slides and I think my preference for the day is I'm going to actually um, blast through the slides fairly quickly on a first pass. And uh, but you'll see the reason for doing that is and I'm gonna leave out a lot of the details. Um, I actually Robert. have, pardon? You missed Robert. Oh, did I miss Robert? I'm sorry. Robert, how did I miss you? Say hi, Robert. Oh, is it working? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Took me a minute. For some reason I couldn't get audio on this call. Um, yeah, I'm calling in from the Markham, Ontario area. Uh, I forget the prompts. I think uh, I came to systems likely through just curiosity and exploring online communities and different blogs and things. Uh, I think I also got more interested in it when I was studying mechanical engineering. Um, I guess causality comes in there somewhere. And uh, I guess I took it, got more familiar with, I guess, I don't know what you'd call the, the landscape of different systems thinking or different labels to meeting David Ng and his systems thinking Ontario products. Um, you likely just heard my uh, newish born son James in the background. So I'm playing here with him while listening in. And um, yeah. uh, in terms of the, the book and the, the film, I, I haven't read or watched either. I'll stop there. Good. Now, now ever, I'm really suspicious why no one has seen this Academy Award winning film because I'm, I'm, I thought that I thought that I watched films a lot, but I guess maybe not. So anyway, um, so the this is actually an extension of some work that um, that's been going on through the System Changes Learning Circle as as the circle puzzles through what it is I'm trying to actually work on and why I'm going particular directions. And so uh, I took the opportunity because we have an open slot for August, uh, usually a slow month that we would actually talk about, um, nat uh, uh, sorry, it says natural, should be normal accidents, I'll have to correct that, normal accidents, high reliability and wicked messes. And this is also related to the natures and system changes uh, and the designing for learning that was actually in a paper that was submitted for the RSD conference, um, but it was too long. So it won't be seeing it there. It'll be repurposed in another way. Um, but here's the agenda. Um, the, the, the first thing I want to talk about is just a little bit of the context about why um, I'm looking in normal accidents in the first place. Um, then we'll spend a long, long amount of time in normal accidents itself in the book. And I'm actually going to go through uh, the whole book. It's taken me a fair bit to actually extract. It took longer than I thought to extract the key points. But uh, we'll go through fairly quickly. Um, then there's a short brief on the high reliability organizations work and into the wicked messes work that uh, Ian Mitroff does. And then tying it together at the very end would be um, just some ideas we have on theories of change and whether we can get to more leading to less or less leading to more or what, whatever it's gonna be. So the, the, the first question that are asked you know, kind of could kind of root around this is, is it in the nature of a system uh, uh, or system or system change to fail and for the system to recover and to learn. Um, this is actually something I, I've taken out. You could do many sources about failure, but I decided to take one from uh, Henry Petrosky. And he says that failure is the unifying principle in design of things large and small, hard and soft, real and imagined. Whatever is being designed, 
success achieved by property anticipating and obviating failure. Uh, he tends to write a lot about engineering sort of things like bridges falling down and things like that. Um, but uh, it, it, it's kind of interesting when you start thinking about failure and systems together. And he says, small things which are typically mass produced in staggering large numbers can be tested by sampling. Now, when you talk about bridges or things like that, or when we start getting a normal accident, uh, we, and we start working on things like nuclear reactors, they're very large things, they're custom or uniquely built. And so you can't test them in the way that you'd want to actually test something you had to control over. So when we're talking about systems at large scale or in complexity, you have to hope that they're self-healing in some way or built in that they could actually recover. And some of that you can anticipate and some, but you can't. And so the question is, how do you deal with that? Uh, in the system changes learning circle, we've been dealing with a number of modes of systems changes. Um, three are unfolding nature, which would be kind of things that are working as, the, as nature would have us, like you have flower growing. Uh, fixing problems, which would be like engineering resilience, so we have a solution. And also we have a category of making history, which is disclosing new worlds, which would be bringing new innovations that no one had thought of before. And so when we're talking about taking action and we're talking about changes, these are the type of things, um, the systems that you systems you may or may not be able to influence. Now, when we talk about systems change as opposed to systems thinking itself, um, you end up with a question about whether the intervention is going to actually be better than what you have today. And so if you go back to um, Russ Aikoff as an example, he had this idea that you should never intervene in a system that you don't understand. Um, that'd be consistent with the Hipp Hippocratic Oath uh, unfortunately, when you look at the, um, the management literature, like if you look at Tom Peters, there's this bias for action. Um, and the question is, you know, should you actually do nothing because nothing is doing nothing is actually better than you could actually hope for um, by, if you actually intervened. And that brings us into the idea of um, doing and not doing errors of commission, errors of omission. And Russ Acoff, uh, there's a blog post I'd written about this. And so what happens often is that we actually get um, measured or people <laughs> notice uh, about the errors of commission, errors when we do something, but the errors of omission, which is something you should have done, is something that's omitted. And, and that's a, a, it's a fault. Um, it's actually, in, like discussing research papers, publishing failures is generally not considered to be an award-winning strategy. <laughs> um, and so you, people like to hear about successes, but you know, people should actually write up their failures and experience reports. In, in Chinese uh, philosophy, we have the idea of willful action and non-intrusive action and a uh, way and wu way. And this brings in the idea of nature. And so the question would be, is the nature in that system to that it would make the change itself or would you have to take a wu way, an unnatural way to direct the people in the way they go. And so this, this speaks to the ideas about self-organization, about whether you could get a system to behave in the way you would like it to behave, uh, in the way that it would like to behave. Um, and we've had this running joke within the System Changes Learning Circle. We talk about beavers because we get a little bit too anthropocentric quite often. And we start talking about uh, human beings and, and then uh, human beings have a distinct um, advantage or disadvantage of will. Um, and so we often say that it give the test, well, you know, what would a beaver do in this case? Like if beavers actually build, they build dams, uh, they build lodges, they fell logs, you know, they change the environment. And so, you know, if, if we're thinking about this, when we think about human nature, you end up with this question about whether it is harmful or not harmful. Um, Beavers have this, uh, have this thing where the sound of dripping water drives them crazy. And so that's part of their nature that they actually will go and repair dams because they just don't like the sound of running water. Uh, and it could be with human beings that we have those sorts of quirks and that's the way we behave as well. When I talk about learning, we have three types of learning. I'm gonna skip over this quickly. Uh, we'll come back to it if we have to later. Uh, in, in Bateson's idea, we have three types of learning. Proto-learning, which is a change within um, a, well, I, I'll give the dolphin example. Uh, a proto-learning would be uh, you give the dolphin a treat uh, and it learns to do the same trick over and over again. 
Deutero learning is that you want you reward the dolphin for a new behavior. And Trito learning would be you take the dolphin out of the tank, you put them in the ocean, they try to get tricks there, which is a change in the environment. And so when we're talking about learning, some systems can learn and some systems can't. And the question is, if you were going to design a system for learning, what would you design it at what level? One thing for sure, though, is that stable equilibrium is death. Um, and so uh, if you think about systems, systems should actually adapt and learn as they go along. If they aren't learning and adapting, they're dead. But learning is not a transmission of representation, it's an education of attention. So when we actually think about learning, it's what you pay attention to, and perhaps we should be paying attention to some of the things that uh, we have in failure. One of the questions that we would have is, are your changes systematic or systemic? Um, systematic tends to be uh, procedural, uh, adaptive change sorts of things, non-living systems, very reactive. Systemic change often happens generationally. You may not be able to change it within the current generation. Uh, if you're like thinking of uh, panarchy or one of those models where, or a birth or death situation, uh, there's something that the parents may not be able to fix, maybe they'll fix it in the next generation. And it's a, it's a co-responsive thing where you change with the environment. So that's kind of the background about stuff we've been thinking in system changes. I'm gonna now spend some time going through normal accidents. And I'm gonna do that in a fairly extensive way. I'm gonna start off with Charles Perrault in the sense of his actual career. He started, he finished his PhD at Berkeley in 1960, the sociologist, and he passed away in 2019. Um, so in 1970, he published Organizational Analysis of Sociological View. For those of you who are, are uh, actually around business schools, um, I come from an era when the professors never were not graduates of business schools. The professors actually were graduates of the discipline. So as an example, Charles Perrault would be influential in the business community. And the idea of organizational analysis, that you actually study organizations and business was actually a relatively new idea in 1970. In 1972, he published Complex Organizations, a critical essay. And so he's starting to dig into that. In 1979, he ended up on the Presidential Commission on the Accident on Three Mile Island. And we'll talk about Three Mile Island, and that is the focus of the book, a nuclear plant, um, and the, uh, the thing the movie came out about. Uh, in 1981-82, he was a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, which is in, um, at, at Stanford. Uh, and that's actually the same center that a lot of uh, systems people have gone to. Uh, Gregory Bateson, as an example, is one of the people that went there. Uh, but it's a place where systems kind of comes into the thinking. Uh, now, when, when Perot wrote the book, oh, someone's got to go on mute, it's getting some noise here. Some rattling, sorry, okay. So, um, in, so in 1979, when he, he was actually asked on very short notice to contribute to the President's Commission uh, and he wrote a very, very short paper. And then when he went to the Center for Advanced Studies, uh, he actually got the opportunity, hired grad students and did more research and came out with a book and published the book, Normal Accidents, Living with High-Risk Technologies. And, um, and that became actually, it's, a, it's actually a bestseller, um, uh, but it's, it was published 12 days, uh, it was published 12 days before the movie The China Syndrome came out. And The China Syndrome has James Fonda, has Michael Douglas, very young at that, at that age. Um, but the fact that the movie came out and they had normal accidents at the same time, which was written about a nuclear accident, uh, got a lot of popularity. So people, a lot of people read the book. Um, Perot continued for a long time. In 2002, he published Organizing America, Wealth, Power, and the Origins of American Capitalism. We start looking at how the American uh, uh, democratic system is failing. Um, and, and he was asked to sit on the uh, symposium on the 9-11 Commission report uh, in 2004. And there's an article that came out about that. And there's, uh, uh, it, it, there's an interesting question there. Is this an organizational failure or an executive failure? And you get into that question uh, from someone who's doing work in systems. So which system are you talking about? Do you actually say an individual failed or do you say the organization failed? In 2007, he published the last book, The Next Catastrophe, Reducing Our Vulnerabilities to Natural, Industrial and Terrorist Disasters. 
Um, and uh, then he contributed to other things in 2013. There's an article on uh, nuclear denial from uh, when he was writing about Fukushima. And in 2015, he wrote about regulatory state, which related to the work they'd done on the 2002 book. So very well respected um, uh, sociologist, uh, president and vice president of various organizations. And so the normal accidents book is kind of in the middle of it and it's the one he's best known for. So let me talk about this. I'm gonna go through chapter by chapter and talk a little bit about the book. And if people are interested, you can find it and read it. Um, so the introduction, he talks about uh, an everyday events and how things chain together. So you go to make coffee, but the pot is cracked. And so, you know, you don't have time for coffee. And then the day gets started badly. You go and uh, you, you go and you're going to go to the car to drive to work, but then you left your keys, and you lock them in the apartment and you go, oh, that's really bad. Uh, well, I, and I, I go, you go to get the key for your apartment in the place that you normally would have kept it, except that you lent that key to someone so you can't even get back into your own apartment. So you decide that you're gonna to go to borrow your neighbor's car uh, and the neighbor was there, but unfortunately uh, the neighbor's car generator is broken and so he can't start the car. And that's on the same day there's a lockout by, a bus drive, by the bus drivers and so you can't take the bus either. So you phone to be late for the meeting and what happens is that uh, when you phone, you actually end up talking to a, a a, um, an assistant who isn't paying much attention to put you in the bottom of the list and you can't actually get a meeting scheduled, rescheduled. She forgets about your meeting and doesn't actually reschedule your meeting. So your whole day is just gone. So the question he asked is what was the primary cause of the foul up? Like, and, and this is when you get into the idea of the accident, which is, was there one cause? Is there multiple causes? And how do you differentiate between the two or the multiple types? Um, so, in chapter one, he talks about normal accidents at Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island, um, this, the photograph actually used on the Eventbrite page is actually by the Harrisburg Airport. So if you're in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, or taking off, you can actually see the uh, nuclear plant there. Uh, the Unit 2 startup issues, they had problems since 1978. There, and so before anything, before this event happened, um, they're having issues just starting up the nuclear plant. The maintenance force was overworked. You had Metropolitan Edison suing Babcock and Wilcox on, an, on the errors in construction. You've got a countersuit that Babcock and Wilcox says that Metropolitan Edison doesn't, they're incompetent on running their machines. And so, you know, is it actually the machine or the human beings with that? So what happened was that the cooling system should actually tell the pumps that the cold water is not flowing. But during maintenance, a valve was accidentally left in a closed position. And so when the pipes came on, it went into a closed pipe. Uh, on, uh, you, wouldn't, you can't see the switch where, that, uh, that, um, where the, the lever is to close the pipe because there's a repair tag hanging over it just by random. The steam generator boils dry, the relief valve gets stuck open, the reactor core gets a heat buildup and the high pressure injection valve that should have put in water fills up, but then because you've got an open valve, it leaks out and the operators are in the dial and which one is wrong. And so one of the things that they emphasized in this accident at Three Mile Island, and, and this is one of the things that uh, differentiates from the movie, is that actually there was no accident in the sense of there's no human accident. Uh, there was a, uh, some steam that was released, uh, but there was no meltdown. And the question is, well, you know, is this under control or not under control? And is this accident normal? Should you expect that accidents are going to happen? So that leads us to chapter two, nuclear power is a high risk system. Why we have not had more three mile islands, but will soon. So he talks about the nuclear industry uh, where you have operating experience, where you have very, very few large plants and you have a lot of downtime in the plants, but you in fact, you can't learn about it because you don't actually have that much experience building uh, with running the plants. There's a construction problem that you only have one engineer for the NRC with each plant. So when you're expecting a huge facility and the national, uh, the, the regulatory commission, nuclear regulatory commission, um, is, it has one engineer on site to check everything. Um, 
Now, the question as to whether they could have had a safer design, Americans have always preferred pressurized light water reactors, um, not the heavy water reactors. Canada's had can the can-do reactor, which is a safer reactor because it uses heavy water. There's also gas-cooled ones, apparently, that are, are available, but through the politics of, uh, of the United States, they would like to use the American technology, and that's not as safe. Um, now, if they're building defense in depth, the question is, how safe do you want to be? The nuclear reactor is inside a containment building. There's emergency core cooling. The plant is actually away from the population, and the dangers aren't imminent, but the dangers are still there. Now, you also have what are called trivial events in non-trivial systems. And so uh, a janitor comes and the shirt catches on a circuit breaker. You know, he just turns around and, and the shirt ca causes the circuit breaker to go off and that causes a, uh, an incident. Uh, another thing that happens is that because the water actually goes out into the river, the, there's clams in the river, the pipes get clogged and the diameter of the clams gets narrower. Um, can we learn from our mistakes? Well, if you actually read the newsletters that come from the, uh, from the, uh, the reports that happen is they always go, well, we had, this act, we had this incident, we had that incident, but everything under control. Um, and so within the publications that are, made, that are distributed, there isn't a balanced view of what's happening in the accidents or in the operation of nuclear plants, because it's kind of like, oh, don't worry, we have everything under control. Uh, finally, you have the fuel cycle as a system, a big system with uranium mining, processing, boiling, and waste. And so the nuclear plant is one thing, but also you've got the whole nuclear industry all the way from uranium mining, and it's, uh, it's a tough thing to, to manage. Okay, next page. Okay, chapter three defines a, a systematic examination of a high risk system. And he uses the term normal accident as a system accident. And the way he describes this, and the, this graphic helps a little bit, is, is a systems diagram. So at level one at the bottom, you've got a part like a valve. Level two, you've got a system, a steam generator. Level three, you've got a subsystem, like a secondary cooling system. Level four, you've got the system, the nuclear plant, and you've got the environment, which is outside of the plant. So um, he divides this up on the, on the right side. Uh, he, he has, this is what he had written. So he says, incidents involve damage or failures to a part or a unit only. So that's level one and level two. And that may cause the system to stop, but it doesn't destroy the system. What he's calling an accident is a system as a whole, and it would in effect stop the whole system and actually destroy, has a potential to destroy the whole system. He also makes distinction between the level four and the level three, the component level failure um, that, you, that might eventually, if you have enough subsystems failing, you may end up with a, um, in the level three, you would have a level four system failing as a whole. And so system accidents involve the unanticipated <coughs> interaction of multiple failures. And so the, the system accident is not a failure of a single thing. It's multiple failures that happen together. Okay, he writes that humans are part of all systems considered, but it's important for analysis to treat the humans in most systems as parts. Um, and on the left side, he writes that it sounds kind of heartless, but um, he thinks that you have to include humans inside the system. And so uh, when people think about systems, because where you draw the system boundary, the is inside the outside system, you don't have humans inside the system, they're part of the system. But in particular, he's not so, he's just on what he calls third party and fourth party victims. The first party victims are the operators, so the people inside the nuclear plant. Second party victims are the people who are, are system users, such as passengers on a ship. So there'd be people that would be um, associated with maybe the electrical power. The third party victims are innocent bystanders and the fourth party victims are fetuses of future generations. And so the problem is as we move from the first party to the fourth party, the number of part people that get involved rises geometrically, the risky activities are less well compensated and the risks taken are increasingly unknown ones. And so he's focused on this from a, a, a 
from a large systems perspective when you're looking at everything. So he looks at this in two dimensions and there's a two by two matrix coming. I'm gonna cover one of the dimensions first when he says that system prone to system accidents exhibiting one interactiveness which confuse the operators. I'll get to the tight coupling later. And so for those of you who are up on the system language I usually use, the uh, interactiveness normally we would call structure and the coupling, the tight coupling we'd call process because it's in the, the interactiveness is at a point in time, the tight coupling is over time. So he talks about complex interactions and they're in there, they have unfamiliar sequences, unplanned, unexpected sequences, or they're not immediately visible. Um, whereas the linear interactions are expected and you can see them if they're visible. So you have, if you go down the list, uh, complex systems versus linear systems. When you have a, a, have a complex system proximity, it's all together. Linear systems are, are in sections or segregated. We would call them complicated. In a complex system, you have a, so we could take the example of, of um, my usual example of talking about is usually talking about a mainframe as being a complex or uh, as opposed to a computer network being complicated in a linear system. So in a, in a complex system, you have a common mode connection, you have one big system. Um, in a linear system, they are disconnected and you can take them apart. So there's dedicated connections, uh, complex, everything's interconnected as opposed to segregated. Um, when you're actually going to fix stuff in a complex system, there's limited substitutions. We're now getting into that issue at the beginning when he's talking about large systems and in effect how they're built. Um, and uh, you, you can't, they're all customized parts. So you just can't go to the local corner store and buy something where the linear system it tends to be off the shelf uh, sort of components. A lot of feedback loops as opposed to few feedback loops. Um, the multiple interactive controls in a complex system as opposed to having single purpose, smaller segregated controls, indirect information versus direct information. And a complex system, you, the complex system by definition, you can't understand everything. Linear system, you have a better chance of understanding everything. So the question is, well, why do we build complex systems? And the reason is complex systems are more efficient. And this is a basic system property that complex systems are more efficient. And so we tend to like them, but then we they get into the way and we get in trouble with building too many complex systems. Type coupling means no slack or buffer or give between two items. What happens in one part directly affects what happens in the other. We have tightly coupled systems that respond quickly. If they respond quickly, that means that failures or shocks or perturbations uh, can actually ripple through a system quickly. On the right side, loosely coupled systems can incorporate shocks and failures without destabilizing. And so in a tight couple, tightly coupled solution, you can't delay processing because the system is a complex, it just keeps moving. Loose coupling, you have uh, systems and you may have buffering between them. Uh, if you think about a, uh, um, think about transportation network, hub and spoke networks, um, they're, they're a loose coupling. Uh, tight, a tight coupling has invariant sequences because you're looking for the most efficient. Loose coupling, you have rerouting. The order of sequencing can be changed. So on the internet, as an example, the data arrive, The data goes from one place, it leaves one place, it arrives someplace, but the data packets can go different routes to get there. Tight coupling has only one method to achieve the goal, which is the, uh, the, the optimal or the most uh, efficacious. Uh, loose coupling has alternate methods. Uh, with tight coupling, you have little slack possible in supply equipment and personnel. In loose coupling, you have slack. Uh, in tight coupling, you can build in buffers and redundancies, uh, and they are deliberate. In loose coupling, it's part of design, and they're fortuitously available. So you kind of you when you're in between two small systems are interacting with each other, it's the interaction will take uh, take some of that slack. With tight coupling, the substitution of supplies, equipment, and personnel is limited and designed in. And loose coupling, you can go to the corner store and buy something off the shelf. So in tightly coupled systems, the buffers, redundancy, and substitution have to be thought up in advance. In loosely coupled systems, um, you, you have a better chance that you can pick up something expedient, go to the corner store, go to a hardware store, get a substitute, and you can actually build something. Uh, you can actually uh, substitute and, and make things work. So if we put this in the two by two matrix, this is a uh, interaction coupling chart. So on the um, 
x-axis, we have the interactions linear or complex. On the y-axis, we have the loose coupling and tight coupling. And so if we look at the upper left, uh, we have tight coupling and linear. And so the example, he says that um, in dams, um, there are no, there's not much unexpected in a dam. The water flows into the dam. You have water coming in, you have water going out. Uh, if there's a flood, actually, you're probably gonna know the flood upstream, but it's, it is a tightly, um, tightly coupled system, but it's linear. So you can manage that. Going down, he, he talks about, um, about post offices. Um, and a post office doesn't have many un unexpected interactions. He compares that actually, if you go to the uh, lower right, to universities, and it compares how they're different. So in the case of post offices, the number of interactions is, is well understood. Like you, they pick up mail, they deliver mail, have different types of packages, all that. Universities have multiple functions, teaching, research, and public service, and they interact in unexpected ways. And so, um, so universities are loosely coupled and complex, which is okay. Um, and he actually says that, well, universities are high in complexity, but we're not likely to have a system accident at a university, not like a nuclear plant. So, so failures are actually forgiven at universities. Uh, he actually writes about um, grading a student wrong and then having time to change the grade when you realize it's a mistake when it comes through inspection. So um, system accidents don't happen in that sense. Uh, when, through the funding by the National Science Foundation, the Behavioral Science Center, uh, Perot got uh, graduate students to extend the research. He looked at petrochemical plants, uh, and these, these were all um, uh, library research, in effect, about failures um, and system accidents in petrochemical plants, aircraft, airways, marine accidents, uh, dams, quakes, mines, and lakes, and space weapons and DNA. So it's all, on, and that takes up half of the book going through all those examples. The last, book, the last chapter closes off living with high room risk systems. And he asks, what, what can we do? Uh, what should we do about all these high risk systems? He said there are three categories. So there are systems that are hopeless and should be abandoned because the risks outweigh the benefits. And those include nuclear plants, nuclear power, so he's an anti-nuke. Systems that we're unable to, unlikely to be able to do without, but could be made less risky with a considerable effort like marine transport. And so that's where the risk is low. Um, in, or there, there could be a case where you have expected benefits are so substantial um, that we could actually, uh, we could actually manage them in, in, in addition. In 1984, he's talking about DNA research. And so he's thinking we could manage that. Uh, and then the third is that uh, systems that are mostly self-correcting um, and then they could actually do modest improvements. That includes most of the systems. And he talks about the rationality associated with this. So you have the absolute rationality, which is uh, what you have with economists and engineers. You have the bounded rationality, which is a um, uh, heuristics and biases research for psychologists, uh, Kahneman, Tversky sort of stuff. And the social and cultural rationality. And the social and cultural rationality is that we're, as individuals, we actually are not necessarily great decision makers, but if we actually work together, we can actually bond a diversity of skills and get the better answers. So working through this, um, looking at the interactions, looking at the risks, uh, what happens is that if we look at um, these four categories, again, the question is, do these work or don't work? And this is the logic that Perot uses in coming to those conclusions. So in the case of dams, power grids uh, in the upper left, there's centralization for tight coupling and there's linear interactions, which are expected. So that works out okay. Uh, if you go down, you have, you're gonna have either centralization or decentralization, depending on what the system is going to be. So you have, you have loose coupling and you have, and so make you um, systems are manageable because they, they're really coupled. So tight coupling is big. And lower, we have centralization. Uh, we like systems that are coupled to unity, um, like the arms. And so you can actually want central couple together. So what happens for width is like tight. You want, uh, actually, if, if, let's go the other way. If, if, if it's, it's, because it's complex, you want centralization to deal with the tight coupling. 
So you, in a, in a sense, the way that you actually do this is command and control, inspect everything, um, double check everything. But then the problem is that you, when you have unplanned interactions of failures, you need decentralization because everything is not going to be in the book. And so these demands are incompatible. And that's when he starts putting nuclear plants, weapons, DNA, chemical plants, all these things on the list. And he, he thinks that it's impossible to make that reconciliation when you're dealing with, with um, tight coupling and complex systems. And here's a chart where he scores everything and he creates his alternatives and he shows with a, with a catastrophic potential. And so uh, space weapons uh, have a high catastrophic potential. Um, nuclear power has that. And he charts it like this. So nuclear weapons, nuclear plants are in an area where you should abandon them in the upper left. Um, you should restrict or kind of try to control marine transport and DNA, and you can tolerate and improve. And so that is the policy recommendations. And that's kind of the coverage of the whole book. Um, on high reliability organizations, this happened a little bit after, and this is 1991, there's a high reliability organization group in Berkeley, and they looked at it from a different point of view and they said, look, um, there are a lot of high hazard organizations and they do, tend to do okay. Like, you know, we, can we actually go and do that research instead? And um, there's criticism. Now, this is what happens when you do inductive case study. And that's what both of these uh, researchers are doing. But in this case, they said, okay, we're not doing random samples. We're actually going to go and find examples where we think there are high hazard organizations that are doing pretty well. So air traffic control systems, we don't have plane crashes that often, so how do they operate? Uh, how does electricity operate? Because it doesn't go out that often, Pacific Gas and Electric, this is back in 1991, so they don't have the fire steel what they have today. Uh, peacetime flight operations, the nuclear aircraft carriers of the Navy, and then uh, nuclear production at the uh, Diablo, Diablo Canyon plant. Um, so this is actually a research question, and so, um, how, how do these organizations come to be? Uh, what's the evolution of them? There's, there are six questions they went through. Um, the first was, what, how do these organizations come to be? What are the second one? What are the structural patterns and what are the managers of uh, management? How's, how are independencies managed? Uh, question three, how do they make decisions? Uh, question four, what's the organizational culture? Question five, what's it like when they get high risk systems? And question six, What's the design of consequential organization systems like? So how would you actually organize the systems? But one of the focuses they say specifically, and this is why it's a little bit different from normal accidents work, is that they were not interested in giving recommendations. They said they're envisioned that they're gonna have a discussion on design issues that can be taken up by managers, operators, and regulators they wanted to. And so you don't get a normal accidents type of book out of the high, reli high reliability organizations group. Now, it turns out that this group has actually continued. And um, uh, when we were visiting, um, Susu Nosala and I were visiting um, Ian Mitroff. Uh, Ian is actually in this group at Berkeley, the Center for Catastrophic Risk Management. Um, and uh, a lot of the people that you see in the HRO uh, community are actually in this, uh, in this group. They meet monthly and they have talks. So if you're interested in a uh, high level, in, HROs and catastrophic risk management, then this is a place you could go. And as an example of the talk that they just gave in June, um, and this is on YouTube, you can watch this one if you want, um, the COVID pandemic, they worked through high reliability theory. And so Paul Shulman and Emery Rowe are some of the people that were originally involved with the research with HROs. Uh, I'm gonna talk about wicked message just briefly. Um, now, the, the issue we have with wicked messes is that we're making errors, and Ian Mitroff has this categorization uh, when you're looking, and for people who have taken statistics, you normally get one, two errors. So, type errors, so you think it could be less. It is a positive. Okay, so, you found statistical errors, you said the drug works, but it actually doesn't. You got a false negative, which is a type two error, which is, oh, actually the drug works, but you didn't actually prove that statistically. Then you run into the type three error, tricking ourselves, which is solving the wrong problem precisely, which is, oh, this drug actually solve, actually heals something else, but we didn't actually um, test it on that. Um, and then we have the type four errors of tricking ourselves, which is the intentional error of solving the wrong problems. And this is what happens, we get a lot of misinformation. Um, 
and this starts getting us into a lot of the messes that we get into. Now, Ian actually, and this was reading, we're, we're having a reading group with Ian separately. And um, in his 2019 book, he actually has done a variation on, on both wicked problems that comes from uh, Rittell and, um, uh, Riddle and Weber um, and messes that come from Russ Acoff and talks about wicked messes. Um, and uh, so wicked problems for those who, have, who have, are not familiar with it, um, they have these problems, they're unbounded, so they can't be solved, they're ill-structured, they don't stay solved. Uh, and so wicked problems you can't actually solve. Um, Russ Acoff came up with the idea of a mess and it's a whole system of problems that are highly connected and the problems don't exist independently, so you can't solve any of those without solve. You can't solve a problem without causing a problem somewhere else or solving all the problems. Um, Ian has extended this by calling by what he calls wicked messes, and they're not only pathological, they're cancerous. And this would be like the type four errors you see. Um, and the problem is that you run into the situation where every action you take to may do something good actually causes the opposite. So anything you do is gonna make things worse. Um, and that could be some of the problems we're talking about with wicked, uh, wicked messes. It could be the problem we're talking about if we have normal accidents. On theories of change, um, we're gonna start dealing with this a little bit more within system changes learning circle because we talk about theories of change. And Peter had talked about this in System Thinking Ontario last November. Um, we have this idea about theory of change. And what we like to do is actually bring some of these ideas about the nature of systems into the theory of change and, and have a suggestion, have a discussion about whether you have a real theory or don't, if you not have a real theory. And if you look at, uh, this is Mintzberg's um, uh, diagram. Uh, typically when people come in, they assume that they're gonna have an intended strategy and, and it's gonna, and it's gonna re result in deliberate strategy, but some of those deliberate strategies fail and they become unrealized. You've also got emergent strategy comes in. And so in effect, there's things that are going to happen along the way, and the question is, how do you adjust and make this real? One of the things that I ran into when I was writing the Open Innovation Learning Book, and this actually came out a lot of Ian's work, is the idea of more and less. Um, and so the the actual case that Ian talks about is actually um, nuclear uh, proliferation, and so the issue you get into is you have both sides having more. So more nuclear weapons leads to more nuclear weapons, which leads to less. So we have more leading to less. And the question is, should we actually be dealing with a world where we have more le less leading to more? And can we think about that as other alternatives? So that's the basic idea. That's a really uh, high level scan through all of the work. Um, normal accents was the focus. Um, and I'll be interested to discuss and see what people think and have questions and discussion. Well, that was quite a pace, uh, David. Yeah, there's a, a lot to take in um, there, even if you are already familiar with it. Um, what would be a good question to open the discussion, do you think? I mean, how would where, where would you like to see, I mean, how would you kind of open the discussion? Because there's a lot of different areas that we could cover. If we just leave it, it might just be uh, an, inv an inviting way to open it up to a particular question that we could start with. Um, I think one that we could start with is about the nature of systems and whether we actually design for failure or not. Um, and, and so, you know, so, we have, we have you and, you know, have Zad from the SFI program. I don't know if you take failures in seriously or is that something you can do or if that's part of the foresight program or that's part of the system, so. Well, it's not. Yeah. And, and, we've, and, and neither, neither do we explore it that much in the design for, design for health program either. I mean, it's, it really would deserve like a different type of course. It would be an emphasis in the human factors course and maybe have a human factors course that was that was informed by systems thinking, systems engineering. In the systemic design, 
you know, we explore, we, we explore uh, philosophies, theories, and methodologies, but that are oriented towards kind of the, the problem areas that, that learners themselves are interested in. So we don't really, th this is a pretty sophisticated area and it re, that is there, it has, it has a few decades of development and controversy as well. Um, I think one of the areas that really ought to be explored, especially the, this question about where system failures do occur, um, you know, going into the Design for Health program in particular, I think it is something that we should, it happens a lot in healthcare because uh, healthcare um, hospitals as complex organizations are, are large, loosely coupled organizations of tightly coupled functions. So especially surgery in any specialized um, medical uh, treatment as a function um, is going to be, you know, it's going to be, there's going to be a mix of structure and process, of course, but it's, but in fact, take surgery in particular, failures that occur within surgery are all, you know, tightly coupled, happen strictly within, within, uh, you, you know, within the, 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 the focus of attention of, of a surgical team on, on coordinated tasks that have, that have to happen precisely Usually, usually it's linear, but there's a lot of complex interactions that are hard to predict because things come up, but it's, it's, it's tightly coupled. And then if there's failure there, it's within, it, it can be catastrophic to, you know, the patient. But then when you look at a classic loosely coupled kind of problem that can be complex and problematic, it's common in healthcare is, okay, so so, so the uh, patient's had a surgery, it's been reasonably successful, but let's say that they've had a hip replacement and they start to reject it, but, they're, but that isn't gonna be determined like right in the step down, it's gonna be determined in the next, in a transition. So you've got loosely coupled transitions all over the place in healthcare. You've got somebody comes out of surgery, they go into step down, they're being observed within the hospital and maybe they'll go through through two rooms before they're discharged. But the discharge process requires them to also, if they've got a hip replacement, to go into rehab. And so maybe they're going to a whole different, you know, they, they've got a completely different situation now. And so if that if the kind of rejection of this of the of the hip occurs while they're in rehab, then determination needs to be made, you know, to get back to surgery. So there's there's not a so that handoff into the different things can happen while they're being handed off too. It can, what Richard Cook calls drop the patient. Um, that is, you can kind of lose track of them in the transition. And so that's another place where failures can occur. And these are very common. I mean, you think the COVID numbers are bad. I, I mean, you know, the medical act between medical accidents and iatrogenic, um, uh, diseases, uh, sepsis, I mean, it's way more than COVID deaths every year. And there's very little liability for this. So there's high, you know, these are supposedly high reliability organizations. They have, they have massive flows of failures and we don't know how to deal with them. Part of the problem is, is that they, the, the failures are catastrophic to individuals and not, and so therefore the accidents can be buried and they can be easily, kind of easily covered up, unfortunately. There's not a whole lot of liability because there's a lot of risk and people sign that off. But imagine if a hospital blew up, <laughs> you know, then, then you're dealing with, you know, kind of nuclear, you know, nuclear power plant type of accident. But because they're distributed over a, you know, over a, a large number, it's a different type of thing. Now, this is a, a high reliability type of, uh, organizational accident that is that is you know and I just wonder where that would fit um, I mean I, I, I can see it in the plot in your plot there but this is a common situation that we ought to be learning from to try to improve for one thing the systems engineering of of healthcare and hospitals and of the you know the more integrated approaches because we should know how to do that better by now you know, and also there's some criticism of the um, normal accident theory about it being pessimistic in terms of the, the potential, you know, for, for better design. 
and I, and I, I kind of wonder what your thoughts are on that. I mean, I, I should be pessimistic about healthcare. I just think that we're dealing with a situation in healthcare where you've got so many different languages spoken, different specializations, different levels of, of management, different levels within the organization. And, and, and Dick Knowles is somebody who would also know about this kind of, you know, different levels of the organization and, and tightly coupled kind of problems in the chemical plant. But in, I'd say in healthcare, it's, um, you know, you've, you've got people that are actually speaking different languages. They think they understand each other and things can break down. In nuclear power plants, everyone should be speaking the same language. And that, that is, they shouldn't have uh, language or programming interface problems, but they still do. And so it seems like Pero is, is, is pessimistic that we could resolve these situations and actually develop better technology, you know, even over the long term. So those are some of my questions. I think healthcare is, is really, you know, it's a, it's a more accessible issue maybe for, for most of us to consider. Um, although I've had um, at least one graduate student who was a thermal engineer in the Pickering plant and, and she started working with organizations and now she's advising organizations instead of uh, nuclear power plants. The dad has his hand raised, so that. Yeah, um, my brother was printing, but he's done now, so the noise is probably reduced. But um, <laughs> the question about do we design for failure is a great question, and Peter and I and Griff and others share the context of SFI and design school. I think I can almost put, wear like a couple of hats. One is culturally, because I come from that strategy and creative industry background. Well, culturally, there was this popular trend, Peter, you recall, about the failure conferences and fail forward and, and embracing failure and move fast and break things, et cetera. I think even in the last year and a half, the tone has shifted on the demise of that trendy culture. And so I wonder if there's a characteristic to add about designing for responsible failure? Can failure be responsible and irresponsible? Can it be irresponsible when you introduce technologies and you don't internally assassinate the risks and rewards of what happens? And can they be responsible when you design the system so that it learns, so that the feedback mechanisms comes to a, a operations team, an executive team, a managerial team, and they're able to have the space, time, and culture to integrate that and this might be connected to, uh, again, I'm connecting this, Peter, to a lot of SFI curriculum, but learning organizations and the things that we do in the final year. But I wonder if there's almost a qualification of failure in itself. And I, and, uh, I guess the question back to you, David, is, was that in, uh, I haven't read the book, was that context in the book? Is there a responsible way of failing to learn, designing for learning? Um, so, so in the book, what, what happens is that, uh, and Perot's pessimism would be that we should not have tightly coupled complex systems. And so I would, I would actually argue that uh, in Peter's description that most of healthcare is actually loosely coupled. It's, it's complex, but it's loosely coupled. And then people think, oh, we're in silos and you move from one silo to the next silo. So you move from treatment to, you know, to recovery and it's like a totally different one you go, well, Maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe, you know, can you imagine if you actually had to couple, you know, treatment and recovery together in one place? It's like, it may not be the most efficient thing. So, so that I'm not sure if that, that responds to your question. Well, I, I think that's helpful to hear that the outcome of the book is to shift away from the top right quadrant. Tightly coupled and complex equals uh, catastrophic failure. Failures that actually have real systemic problems that result in people's lived experiences um, and so then then maybe the second part of my reflection is about designing for learning is using the content in the book which of those structures or layouts allows you to design systems for learning was did the author go into why moving away from tightly coupled complex allows for learning in other modes um, no, th so in 1984, he would have re predated a lot of the, the stuff on communities of practice and, right. and all that sort of learning organization stuff. So it would have been early. Um, so he, his focus was not on learning. 
um, because his belief was that uh, it, nuclear accidents were not learning. There, there's actually a really funny video if you if you want to search. Charles Perot gave a talk at Microsoft. Uh, they invited him at Microsoft Research. It was actually it's a fairly old video, and and what happens is he's at Microsoft and telling him, "You guys are a tightly coupled." a uh, complex system and you guys should actually disaggregate and uh the microsoft people are not having any of that it was pretty funny listening to it because that's kind well, of the discussion goes on <laughs> well you know what that was the case because uh, when bill gates ran microsoft it was very centralized yeah i mean that way it, it is more loose it became loosely coupled after he started uh it was probably early 2000s but you know, when he was running it, yeah, it was everything, everything went through Bill Gates. There's a, a book, Microsurfs, which I'd recommend about the, uh, the pre-Windows era of that. It was ruthless. So the, the final point, maybe in my reflection, and Kelly, I know you have a question, you can jump in and this bridges to that, is maybe in the context of our Toronto scene and what we work on, when we think of let's just pick on social innovation just for fun is the goal of introducing normal accidents, does this allow us in theories of change perhaps? So are we, does this give us cause to reflect on how our interventions may do more harm? Are we, are we supposed to assess the coupling of our systems? Is it an assessment? Is it a reflection? Is it a caveat? I'm trying to wonder what form or shape this reflection takes in the work that we do. So uh, if we uh, back off to the, the um, core question, which is about the nature of systems. Um, and so when we talk about uh, a nuclear plant, it's designed that way for efficiency. Um, so I, would, uh, it was, I guess it was about a month ago on the television news, there was a, a, a recent um, announcement by the province that they're moving, they're moving forward on modular nuclear um, small, small, they're small modular nuclear devices. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, so what that does is it actually moves nuclear from being, you know, out of that top left corner, yeah. top right corner, right. And so that's not something that that he had thought of, that um, that um, Perot had thought about. But if you actually look at at what he's saying, you know, the opportunity for learning happens then because if you're building smaller devices then you can test them um and you'll have you'll have a track record on them as opposed to building one big plant you can build smaller ones so the possibility of learning there um for uh, so so this is part of and we, and we can use this opportunity kelly actually to, to discuss a little bit about about what might or might not resonate with the people at at csi because we've been talking about swinging over towards theory of change and in effect does your theory of change, firstly, the theory of change that people have, if we go to go back to the, uh, the uh, Mintzberg chart of unintended or emergent things that happen in your strategy, is that people don't necessarily think about things that they hadn't planned, all of a sudden, you know, things line up and things go really well for you, or they don't think about the case where, you know, you actually fail. You know, do people want to think about failure at all? Is that something that is welcomed or are they just scared about talking about it? Of course, what counts as a failure there, though, I mean, those are, it, it could be, you know, if you can consider that, that failures come from different causes, and if you even take a, an Aristotle's four causes point of view of it, I mean, there, it, could, it, it could be that there's, you know, there are situations that are set up uh, you know, from the initial conditions that we don't understand and that are basically failures waiting to happen. There, you know, there can be the, you know, if we look at like the, the uh, Challenger uh, space shuttle accident, you could actually say that um, the, the efficient cause was actually politics there, that they launched on a day that they launched the, the space shuttle on on a morning that was too cold for the operational um, uh, range of the O-rings and engineers knew that. And they were unable to intervene in, in the, you know, in, in, 
you know, at the time or w within time to save it. And they just had to see what might happen, even though there were engineers that knew that there was a, a potential for, for a significant accident to occur. And the reason the Challenger was launched on the day that it was and on that morning was because President Reagan wanted it to be launched that day. Everything was set up for that. It was, a, it was, a, it was actually a significant day. I forget what it was kind of commemorating, but it was basically set up, you know, they, they politically, they could not, they could not uh, abandon that. So, I mean, there was, you know, so the, the efficient cause you could say was, was, was politics there. And that was a, uh, a typical, it was n not a normal accident uh, of that type. And I, I mean, it could be predicted, but it was, yeah. that, but those conditions would normally have been, um, you know, understood and there would have been caution would have ruled yeah. that uh, in the, it, you know, in the three mile Island um, situation, you had complex interactions and you could actually even say, what if you had trained people differently? And that's the kind of thing that they would often say with these types of accidents that, um, but then designers would come in with their language and say, obviously the, the controls in displays are too complex for even well-trained people that, uh, to understand because they could, you know, because in a high stress situation, when an emergency is, is happening, people will lose even a well-trained mental model and sometimes do the exact opposite thing that needs to happen. Um, so you can't train for every interaction, every situation. And so like you said about hospitals being loosely coupled, they are, but when accidents do occur, they often happen within these tightly coupled, you know, pockets within within the overall organization, then they aren't caught uh, sometimes. So people will, will be given the wrong drug very often or too much of a dose and it won't, which is within a tightly coupled situation. So a physician has to stay, you know, make the calculations against body weight, type it in right, double check it, get feedback from the order of the medication, and then follow up on it. All those things have to happen or a you know, okay. um, the wrong dose could be given or the wrong let's, drug. Let's, let's, but, let's turn to Kelly because Kelly, Kelly is going to give us some input sure. on message on how, how messaging on this. Well, well, I'm going to segue from what Peter was saying. And I think that there's a difference between uh, do no harm and no fail. And so that could also be uh, a, a different uh, um, category of a loosely coupled and tightly coupled. Uh, cer certainly there would be situations where it's, it's no fail, like, um, um, I don't know, like, like a big, the, the G7, where you can't have the leaders of the free world die. And so that would certainly be a no fail situation, which I don't know, I, I happen to have reference to that situation. But just, just taking us back into the Center for Social Innovation, um, you know, I, th I think that as opposed to what you were just speaking about, the, the there was a different system that was involved in, in the Center for Social Innovation, and I think that, that was economics. Um, you know, when I said to management that what I thought was really um, good about the Center for Social Innovation was that I could um, I could fail fast and safe, and so that that was really important in terms of innovation to happen. Was that that there was failure. Um, to know. David, you've said to me in the past that failure is, is really important because it's something tangible as opposed to that you're right because you're only right for the moment. But when you're wrong or you're failing, then, then you actually know, okay, that was a failure. Um, so, so I don't know in the Center for Social Innovation whether at some point they they, they segued from what their original intent was in terms of uh, being able to nourish at the rate that they wanted to escalate them at. When they started to want to have scale mm. and when they had taken over multiple buildings, they had to change from a, a, a happy kitchen table, loosely coupled group to something that was much more economic in terms of 
who who were the tenants and how much money were, were they bringing in and how can we leverage them for new monies? I, I don't know if that's, sorry, I don't know if that's speaking to what, what uh, you were originally asking me. No, so that, that, that's an interesting, uh, interesting one. So one of the articles that I was reading but didn't put in here, there's actually a book called uh, Set Up to Fail. Um, it's a Harvard, Harvard book, um, Harvard Business School book. And uh, um, it doesn't quite learn, and I, I didn't learn much from it, but I was, I was looking into the question of, as to whether, when you design the system, or, or when you put the system into operation, whether it's designed, whether it's being set up to fail, not that you want it to fail, but in, in the case, it sounds like, okay, you know, we're, we're going to get more real estate. And then, you know, it's like, oh, we're going to have this problem. We have more real estate. Now we have to do this other thing that we didn't want to do. Um, but uh, um, they, you they, the, the system the, failure there, because I, I mean, I don't know if I, that is to, because over the last year, did, is CSI kind of losing one of their buildings or something? Or um, so, so no, no. It, 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 so what happened was that uh, when for the, actually it happened before COVID uh, was that when the funding went down from the province, and so they they had to cut back on the building. And when they moved into the new building, there's actually an entire floor or maybe two floors that that are uncom that are not completed. Oh, well, hang on, because I mean, originally, until very recently, they did not, they purposely did not take funding uh, fr from government funding. So at some point, they shifted over and created that uh, new, new space of entrepreneurship, so that they could do almost training so that they could get funding access. But we did go down from four, uh, four buildings to two. So New York went down and, and also the rented space at uh, Regent Park. So now they have the two buildings that they own. They, they're kind of stuck with them. Uh, and they still have their value. I'm still okay with, with my, my small amount of stock that I've got in it, but I also didn't uh, reinvest more money. So, so one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, Kelly, is, because um, we're, we're talking about facilitating groups at CSI in, in uh, tea parties now, as we call it, in a, in a tea, or we're having discussions. Uh, will dis will ideas about you know designing the system so and and accepting that some designs may not work um, is that going to be welcomed or unwelcomed as a message? I think that it'll be unwelcome because certainly that that has been my experience that uh, just having that as a benefit to, to CSI as an organization, that it was a safe place to fail fast and then carry on um, was not welcome. They were certainly looking for uh, scaling uh, and what exactly is something tangible that you can offer to us that we can market you. So no, I, I don't know that it will be that welcome to people to experience or look into um, how is it that I might might even fail? David, I mean, there could be many different levels at which even even from the organizational side or what what uh, Richard Cook calls the blunt end versus the sharp end of of the organization. You know, was it was it a failure of, of management or of strategic foresight of, in, of anticipating, you know, the, you know, the future relationship of, of the whole business strategy to, to the environment? Is it a business model um, failure that the business model was no longer strategically relevant in, in a new time or did it or, um, stay with um, a situation for too long? Uh, was it actually, kind of management of resources, overextension, you know, so all these kind of, you know, broad organizational issues could also be seen as contributing at least, but then also at the micro end or the sharp end, you know, were there particular decisions we don't even know about? Was it the collection of a number of different decisions or a cascade of, you know, of, of ten, you know, tenants that could no longer afford to stay in it and then the business model had to change quickly but then the time was, was wrong for that. So you have equivalent situations to that. The same questions could be asked um, in, 
you know, in healthcare and universities and other organizations that are maybe more loosely coupled in that they, they, there won't be any kind of catastrophic situation. In fact, you wouldn't even notice from the outside how much reorganizing was done, but there could be quite a bit of, of change of shifts and of costs and of facilities that are moved around that wouldn't be noticeable. And so there could be these you know, failures within the organization when they're loosely coupled like that. Of course, you couldn't do that with a single nuclear reactor and even a modular reactor, it's going to run or it's going to fail too. That is, if it fails, hopefully it's not catastrophic, but just, you know, um, uh, situational. So. Griff has his hand raised. Yeah, hey everybody. Um, I just like to root this in like a interesting local example. I don't know if you folks remember in January, uh, 2020, that um, we all received, well, I did, I don't know if the rest of you did, as far as I know, most people in Ontario did, um, a message on your cell phone, which I think was using the Amber Alert backbone. So your phone had the loud beeping, uh, and I believe it was very early, early in the morning, might have been four o'clock or 4.30, um, uh, coming out of the Pickering power plant, and the message said this. So that's in the, the, the chat. Um, and basically, <laughs> the text said, you know, there's been a small accident, um, but there's no abnormal release of radiation. There's no need to take any protective measures, et cetera, et cetera. So this happened, um, you know, middle of the night. Um, my partner, Erin, um, her, ma her mom, they live in the Rouge Valley, um, which you can literally see the Pickering power plant from like, yeah, right by their house. <laughs> so as you can imagine, um, getting a text like this in the middle of the night, like she was getting her friend um, calling her, crying, freaking out, like thinking, you know, this is, this is it. This is, this is, this is D-Day. Like in that region, they all get iodine tablets mailed to them. Like they, they, there's a whole bunch of precautions that are taken. So I find this just very interesting. And I just wonder what the group thinks about these like sort of preparedness versus like false flag situations, like sort of a, maybe a chicken little situation going on here. Um, and just like what, what this does to the culture um, and, and what, what this does like societally. I just thought it was such a very interesting example that um, ties so closely into the conversation. Thanks. I think we're, we'll turn to someone who hasn't spoken. So uh, Richard hasn't spoken, please. Oh, mute. Okay. This has been very interesting for me as I've been listening to all of you and I keep coming to the conversation after having been a plant manager for like 15 years. And we don't talk lightly about failure because failure usually means someone's died or been badly hurt. The kind of things you just don't want to have. And if we look at some of the Accidents historically, like the big explosion that BP had down in Texas a few years ago and killed a bunch of folks. There's much more to this than the engineering questions. And that is partnering with the people, the men and women who have their hands on the equipment, who live with it 24 seven, need to be treated as if they're intelligent and they have a brain and they can contribute. And too many times they're treated as if they're stupid and don't know anything. These people often know one heck of a lot more. And in combination with the engineers, the two of them can learn together and know a huge amount more. And so one of the major problems I see with a lot of this is that the hierarchies that we have in our organizations get us into a lot of trouble. In the hierarchies, the assumption is those who are higher know more. You know, they're smarter, they're bigger, they're tougher, whatever. And it's more like the Wizard of Oz. They really don't know much more than the other folks. They know a lot about something, but not a lot about everything. And that's true up and down the line. And the key piece to all of this stuff is you know, not having failures. You don't want failures because that means somebody's, you're made a widow or Orphans, you don't want that. 
And what I was able to develop was a method of partnering with everybody. So everybody had a say in what was going on. Everybody was inquiring. Everybody was asking. Everybody was looking for things to do that could be in improvements. Maybe some of the work that's assigned is screwy. You know, you, the gap between the work is imagined and the work is done is often quite big. And if people don't go out and talk with the folks who are actually doing the work, they don't know that the written procedures has some terrible glitches in them and people are working around those all the time because no one's out there talking to them about it. And a lot of times you can look at these accident analyses and they go back and this failed and that failed. That wasn't a surprise to the operators most of the time. They knew damn well that the piece of equipment was screwed up and they knew that management was cutting corners and wouldn't fund it where they pulled an engineer out so the engineer wasn't there to talk with them where the engineers get so high and mighty that they don't want to talk to the operators. The operators don't know what they're doing. I, I would sit with my engineers and raise hell. Look, these folks are living with it. Go out and sit with them and teach them the right language and together you guys can learn and gals. But it's a matter of learning as partners, treating people as if they have a brain and looking for everybody to help. And when we did this, the results got extraordinarily good. And they got good relatively quickly as people began to realize they could speak up, they could talk, they could learn together. And, and there's, it's a matter of rolling up your seats, sitting down with the people, maybe in the middle of the night. You know, what the hell's going on here? What's happening? How is it going? And so I've, and I've listened to your discussions today the idea of the hierarchy being a really serious problem and the partnering is what's needed and the people left out of the conversations, those are all maybe feel uncomfortable. And it doesn't mean what you're saying is not right. That's not the issue. The issue is that it's got to be a lot more people in the conversation. And there have to be people who can speak up in an environment where it's safe, where they won't get picked on, they won't get smacked down for being a smart aleck. How many times, have, for example, in a medical surgery situation that an instrument's been left in the patient and the nurses know it, but the doctor wouldn't let them speak up. And you have the, that kind of a problem where the people close to the work could see and know it, but were not able to speak up about it and talk about it. So that's just another thing I want to put into this. There's more to it than just the engineering side of this thing. Because the people are the ones that are running it. In the, in the Three Mile Island, there was a lot of stuff. It was the operators on the floor knew and could have done and didn't for some reason. You know, a tag obscuring a valve. Come on. Good operators are playing around with that kind of stuff and they know what the hell's going on. And they just don't look at it. But if we treat the operators as if they're stupid idiots and they behave like stupid idiots and they don't help. You don't want that. You can't depend on that. So I'm just coming at this from a plant manager perspective where I never got a phone call that was a social call. When I got a phone call in the middle of the night, something had already hit the fan. So it's a matter of living in this thing and it may be in a different way than some of you guys and gals have had. Hierarchy is a problem. That was a challenger problem. Many times you look at this hierarchy. And the people at the top of these hierarchies have a staggering influence. They can deny it. They can say they didn't mean this or that or other. But having lived in these hierarchies, I know drug on well that the people at the top can have a, one heck of an influence <clears throat> and make it very tough for people to speak up and say, hey, wait a minute. Those engineers and the challenger <clears throat> could have spoken up, but they might have been fired. <clears throat> So we're, that brings up a third point I wanted to make, and that is, are the values of all the people in the system lined up? Is the top value making money or is the top value of people going home in one piece and making money? You know, it's, how are the values lined up among all those who are engaged in the work? If we're in a big hurry, 
values are probably not lined up because the people are operating from different agendas to try to get the thing done quick. So anyway, it's, it's, we're talking complexity here and there's a heck of a lot of it. But we need to partner with our people, incorporate the kind of thoughts that you all are incorporating, but going out and sitting down with the people actually running the equipment and having these conversations is really, really important. And then listening to what they have to say and learning together about how maybe we can even do it better. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know if I made sense or not, but I hope I did. Yeah. You totally did. Uh, that, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I, I've gone from the top of the fashion pyramid down to here because of uh, triple bottom line. And just taking a look at both people and planet has completely tipped up my um, tipped up my world in terms of like looking at those different inputs and seeing how it is that we actually make new products for this planet. So yes, thank you. Thank you. So we have some people who haven't spoken yet. Robert, Tim, or Nishat. Anyone want to contribute some words? I guess they're going to be shy. Okay. I was trying to let someone else talk because I talk too much sometimes, but I'm not going to talk much. Um, thanks yet. And I uh, second uh, what um, Kelly had to say, uh, Richard. That was uh, yeah, very germane and I agree with just about everything you said. And the only thing I wanted to add was uh, two, two thoughts that came to mind uh, during the presentation and listening to the comments. Uh, and it's not you know, it's not great, some great insights, just sort of two reference points that were coming to mind. So I'm just going to mention it. One is the idea of the black boxes, you know, that idea of they have on a plane black boxes. And I recall, and I, I don't know where it's at, Peter, you might know, but the idea of an operating room black box. So the idea of a black box being an affordance that begins to be applied in other areas, not just airplanes. Um, so there's a concept there or a device that's, that's put in place to help uh, uh, gather the kind of information that that arises in some of these complex failures you're talking about or that are part you know woven throughout the conversation today and I don't know if you specifically mentioned them David in the talk I didn't catch this particular slide or if black boxes came up did, did it come up or no did I, did you mention no it? okay yeah so that was just a thought that came to mind um, uh, to point to as a device in the world that seems relevant um, and then the other thought that came to mind and it kind of ties in with what Richard was talking about in terms of getting more people involved. And that's been a major theme of everything I'm doing, trying to diverse, get more variety of input, you know, the whole Ashby situation, just let's, let's get better at getting more variety into the complex processes of consultation and analysis and design and requirements in engineered or other systems, right? But can we just, can we get better at, um, you know, uh, um, the engaging of, of th those broader stakeholders. You obviously had success doing it in your plant context and, and sounds like that was successful and achieved some of the results you wanted. I think that general idea is a major theme in the world these days. Uh, Kelly talked about triple bottom line. It's kind of a similar thing, right? Um, can we look at, uh, and you said, uh, do, are we here to make money or are we here to make money and make sure everybody goes home? So how do all these different variety of, of um, you know, what makes it good, what makes it reliable, what makes it safe, all those things, what, you know, um, how do we get better at, at being able to handle more of that complexity in, in, in a way that uh, nevertheless has sufficient collaborative rationality or what have you to allow us to create this thing we want to create in the world. And I'll just, one last thought, which ties in with what I was just saying. Um, I was in a call this morning where people were talking about their equity lens on their network, their projects. And, and um, what was frustrating is that it's, that's so, it was so huge an issue. They could hardly kind of, we sat for an hour and listened to the presentation and I honestly didn't hear 
anything really said. And, and of course, I didn't, you know, at first I was like, oh, I'm not hearing anything. You know, you're sort of introducing your talk for an hour. Um, but the reality is, is that those kinds of ambitious uh, uh, goals of, you know, re-indigenizing economies or triple bottom line or uh, taking a more human, humane approach to industrial safety that doesn't just sort of put it down on someone's, you know, um, responsibility area, but it gets entirely lost other than make covering people's, you know, whatever in the boardroom, you know, it, it doesn't get rolled in as deeply and as, as richly as it, as it could be. So a lot of those problems are just, just they exceed, they exceed the capacity of, of, of um, you know, the, our, our, what is it, our, what is it, the six, our, our reach exceeds our grasp or whatever the word expression is. The idea is that we can see what we want to do, but it's immensely complex. And I, I just think, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say, but I, I think that your idea of looking at failure as, as, a, as a context and a lens is extremely powerful as a, as a way to look at a whole variety of things. Um, and so I, I just think that, that this could be developed further, uh, you know, somehow into areas that are well beyond industrial safety, which is probably your point of what you're talking about. So anyway, sounds good. It was very enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I'm not sure that, and, and, and this is part, part of what we're trying to do in System Changes Learning Circle is, is, is the, we like the idea, can we actually make it stick? Uh, it, will, it, will people actually take the message? Um, and, and there's the challenge and we'll work on that. Robert or Nishat, do you have any closing words? Did you say something, David? Uh, would you like to, do you have anything to say, Nishat? Not really. <laughs> it's just been a really tiring day for me. It's been in all meetings all day long. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So I think we'll, uh, we'll sign out. Uh, we're kind of on time for a change. Um, and uh, the, we have uh, for, uh, so Peter will be leading the session for um, September, uh, where we'll have SFI students. Our design for health. There'll be uh, health. healthcare synthesis maps if we can wrangle up enough of them. And if we don't, we'll, we'll have a backup topic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I've got a plan for October as well. So we'll work on those. So thanks for joining, everyone. And we'll see you next month. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Take care. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Bye. We'll make a, a, a recording. Are slides available, David? Yes, I'll, I'll make them available. I kept yep. wanting to.